This lesson is on aggregate demand, and the objectives are that you'll be able to create an aggregate demand curve and also interpret an aggregate demand curve and be able to explain the factors that cause aggregate demand to shift. So you'll notice if you look at this graph that the aggregate demand line is graphed on axes that are labeled PL and real GDP. We already know what real GDP is. It's a measure of output in the economy and of course adjusted for inflation. The y-axis, PL, stands for price level and that would be measured by a price index, kind of like the GDP price deflator or the consumer price index. But we're not going to use specific numbers here. We're just going to refer to this as a general indicator of price level. So again, if you look at this graph, it looks like a typical demand curve. It looks like the demand curve for coffee or the demand curve for corn, but it's sloped downward for very different reasons. It wouldn't make sense with aggregate demand, which is demand for all goods and services from all sectors of the economy. It wouldn't make sense to say that people have diminishing utility for all goods. If you buy a slice of pizza, that doesn't diminish your desire to buy shoes, for example. It also doesn't make sense to talk about a substitution effect because what are you going to substitute for all goods? You can't really do it. So we have to understand this curve in a slightly different way. And the three reasons why aggregate demand is downward sloping are listed in this box. Number one is what's called the real balances effect. And we mean the balance on your bank account, for example. When the price level rises, so imagine we're here along the aggregate demand curve, and the price level rises. What that means is that the balance of money that you have in an account, like a savings account or checking account, it loses value. It actually can't buy as much anymore because of the inflation. So where it used to be your dollar would buy you a pack of gum, now you need $2 to buy a pack of gum. So when you lose purchasing power, that real balances effect means as price level goes up, you actually buy less stuff. I'm going to hold off the interest rate effect for just a second. The foreign purchases effect is actually kind of like a substitution effect. And what it's saying is that as our price level, for example, within the United States goes up, goods from other countries that we could buy as imports start to look more desirable. So we might, in fact, purchase more foreign goods rather than domestic goods. And since we're measuring domestic output here and we're measuring domestic demand, that's not going to be helpful to us. The third one, the interest rate effect, is something that you'll understand much better after Unit 4. For now, uh, I'll give you a very abbreviated description of it, and that is the idea that as the price level goes up, there are some items like cars and houses that we have to actually borrow money in order to buy them. So if you're going to borrow money to buy a car, but the price level for the car goes up, now you need to borrow more money to buy the car. And as people start to demand more money from banks, that drives up interest rates. And when interest rates get higher, then as we saw before, there's less demand for things like investment, right? This is going to parallel that investment demand curve. So those are the three factors. And again, we'll come back to the interest rate effect with more clarity when we get to the money market in unit four. This then is the aggregate demand curve. We're plotting essentially price level against output and what all of the purchasers in an economy do as the price level rises or falls. The aggregate demand curve can shift, meaning that without a change in price level, right, consumers and government purchasers and firms and people buying our exports might decide to buy more, right, or less, not related to any specific change in price level. And there's actually a whole lot of things that can shift aggregate demand. This is going to be really fundamental to understanding this unit, how these aggregate demand shifters work. So what are they? Well, aggregate demand is actually made up of consumption, investment, net exports, and government spending. So anything that changes any of those is going to shift aggregate demand. So think back to what we talked about with consumption, right? For example, a change in taxes might shift consumption. With investment, new investment opportunities, cheaper capital, or perhaps unfavorable tax increases on investment. Net exports might change due to changes in the value of the dollar. This list, which is from your textbook, includes a whole lot of other things, 
including changes in expectations, which were in fact shifters in the regular supply and demand as well. Changes in wealth, so if people feel wealthier, if for example the value of their retirement account or the stock account goes up, then they may actually be willing to consume more of their current income and that would cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right. Whereas if they get something in the mail saying, oh, by the way, your retirement account has lost 30% of its value, which actually happened to a lot of people in 2009, then aggregate demand will decrease because consumers will be wanting to save more of their money. The size of the existing capital stock can make a difference because investors, and by investors I mean firms that wish to purchase new capital, are more likely to demand new capital if they don't have very much right now. But if we have a lot of existing physical capital, if we have overbuilt factories, we have more roads than we need, then there's going to be less aggregate demand right now. And then fiscal policy, which we're going to talk about soon in Unit 3, and monetary policy, which will be in Unit 4, those are also going to be factors that shift the demand curve. And those are going to be the policy focus of Unit 3.